Jesus worthy? Let us pray. Father, we acknowledge that you are worthy. Lord Jesus, you are worthy. Spirit of the living God, you are worthy. Lord, we ask, Father, that you will open our hearts wide to receive your word on this morning. Lord, we ask that you give us an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church on this morning. Lord, help us to live a life pleasing in your sight, Father. Help us to humble ourselves to come boldly to the throne of grace to seek help in our time of need. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's my privilege to stand before you and, and share out of God's word this message that the Lord laid on my heart as I sought him as what to say. Christmas has become familiar to many of us and it's become mixed with so many different voices, so many different agendas that are going on. And sometimes it's good just to step back and consider why we celebrate, what we celebrate, and how we celebrate. Amen? Amen. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we'll speak on this topic. The tree that hung the light of the world. Coming from several different passages of scripture. It's more of a topical message today rather than Breaking down one chapter as we, as is our custom. We'll get back to Nehemiah next week. <clears throat> By way of introduction, Christmas is a time of the year when retailers make the most profit. Worked in retail for a season and it, this is the time of the year where you make all your money. Christmas. It's good for capitalism. <laughs> the gift-giving tradition related to the Christmas holiday has been exploited by the world. It has. It's been exploited by retailers, by marketers. To the point in which many unbelievers will celebrate a Christless Christmas. When I was a kid, this was the most exciting day of the year, Christmas Eve. <laughs> Anticipating of, what am I going to get? There's <laughs> many people who don't name the name of Christ, want to delete Christ's name out of Christmas. <laughs> Celebrating a Christless Christmas. It's popular to talk about the Christmas spirit with no mention of the spirit of Christ. It's popular to have a Merry Christmas or a Happy New Year with no mention of holiness. Happiness but no holiness. Scripture does not command us to celebrate Christmas on December 25th, right? But it does command us to celebrate Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Right? I think Paul said that some esteem one day above another, some people esteem every day the same, right? It's a matter of conscience, right? We, should, we can celebrate, you know, we can celebrate Christ. We can celebrate according to our family traditions or what have you. That's, that's not the issue. 
that we're talking about today. But we should celebrate Christ, right? To the point to where we should witness for Christ all year long. However, this season does provide a unique opportunity to proclaim the gospel. And man, we should capitalize on that, right? All right, next slide. Section one. This some fill in the blanks on your outline, so I'm jumping on that bandwagon. <laughs> one, to make sure you don't fall asleep. <laughs> and two, no. <laughs> All right, so the question on the table, did God become a baby, right? This is the elephant in the room, and we gon', we're going to talk about it, right? right? As, as Christians, right, those of us who are believers, who talk about the true meaning of Christmas and the Christ child, and we have to be willing to explain, right, why we believe, why we celebrate Christmas the way we celebrate, right? Did God become a baby? Do you believe that? Yes. yes. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so, the doctrine of the incarnation is central to the Christian faith. Right. <clears throat> Let's look at First John chapter four, verses one through six. It reads, "Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world." By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Amen. The doctrine of the incarnation, that's your first blank. Oh, I'm sorry. I got the, I'm looking at the wrong, fill in the blank. Okay, this one. <laughs> that was last week's. All right, the doctrine of the incarnation, that's your first blank, is central to the Christian faith. Did you know that we track history based on the incarnation? Based on the birth of Christ? B.C., before Christ, A.D. is a Latin term that means the year of our Lord, right? Right? We could say B.C. could be before incarnation. A.D. could be after incarnation. History was divided based on this incident. Even the evolutionists, they try to take Christ out of it and they say before the common era, B.C.E., they had an E on there. <laughs> and then C.E., the common era. Still divided based on the birth of Christ. 
But though we don't see scripture, right, where somebody's celebrating on December 25th, we do see the apostles emphasizing the importance of confessing and believing that God became a human being and was born into the world as Jesus Christ. He says, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So the people who come and knock on your door and try to tell you Christmas is pagan and Easter and all these things are pagan, but they deny the divinity of Christ at the same time. That's the spirit of Antichrist. They want to try to suck you in talking about Christmas trees and all this stuff, and you're denying the divinity of Christ. They're teaching that Christ is a created being that's denying that Jesus Christ. See, when this was written, people knew that Jesus had, had, was, had come in. They knew he was a human being, right? These people, some of them talked to him and interacted with They knew that. The reason he's making this statement is saying that he was God come in the flesh. We call that the incarnation. God became flesh. We're going we're gonna to walk through it. The spirit of Antichrist denies the incarnation. It denies this reality. This is how we discern truth from error. If you want to know if somebody is operating out of the spirit of God or the spirit of Antichrist, ask them what they think about Jesus. <laughs> If they do not confess that God has come in the flesh, it's a spirit of Antichrist. First John chapter 4, that's not Pastor Bell's opinion. It is written. It is written. This is important. Right? The biblical doctrine of the incarnation involves believing what the scripture teaches about God. Right? There is how many gods? One. How many persons? Three. Revealed to us as? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Pastor Ron, excellent job, sir. You, you trained. <laughs> you all just passed the final exam. Amen. Uh, <laughs> One God, three persons, right? Listen, I don't understand how a cell phone works, but I know how to use it. So don't let, don't let people trip you up because you can't explain the mysteries of God. God is an eternal being. Our minds have a limited capacity. You will never be able to understand every detail of an infinite being. But look, a lot of people don't even understand they self, let alone how you want to. <laughs> One God, three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And see, what part of it comes into play is where do you get your information? Amen. What is your source of information? Right? How do we know the nature of God, because he revealed it to us, right? When, when God tells us something that we cannot discover on our own, we call that special revelation, right? How do we know how the world was created? Because God was there, and he told us how, right? But then you got a group of people out there that try to use their five senses, and they say, if I can't figure it out using my five senses, then I'm not going to believe it. And we see where that has gotten us today. People don't even know if they are male or female. They don't even know how many genders there are. It's the truth anyhow. 
The Bible said, proclaiming themselves to be wise, they became fools. Because you rejected the wisdom of God and what he told us. He said, I created them male and female. That's called special revelation. But see, when a person doesn't believe special revelation, then they just start making up stuff. God chose to reveal himself to us. And so there's uh, our, our children are, are uh, the the world tries to in, indoctrinate us and indoctrinate our children through naturalism or, or humanism teaching evolution that you came from an animal to the point to where you have people at a zoo and they exhibit at a zoo like they're just another animal. People volunteering to stand in an exhibit at a zoo with the animals to say we're just another animal. That's, that's what naturalism and evolution gets you. Just, just the animal. No purpose. No reason for being here. You're just an accident. When you die, there's just nothing. Right? No spirit, nothing. Just they deny the supernatural. This is an antichrist doctrine. They're not just denying that Jesus came to the foot. They're denying God, period. And so the question I have to put out there, right? I don't take for granted that everybody in here is saved. How long, as Elijah said, how long will you hop between two opinions? Either the Lord is God, creator of heaven and earth. How long will you hop between two opinions? You can't believe that you evolved from a monkey and God created you at the same time. And see, these are the things that's underlying where we wonder why people are so resistant to the gospel. Because they don't believe there's a creator who has the authority to tell you what to do and how to live. Jesus of Nazareth is a historical person who lived in the first century. Nobody denies that. However, this is what the apostle is talking about. Do you believe he is the second person of the Trinity? That's what you have to come to a decision on. Either Jesus is God or he's not. You have to decide what you believe. And if you know he's God, then you have to respond to that. Next slide. Should be a slide with Micah 5.2. So this is our, our Christmas passage for today. Micah 5, 2. It says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata. I'm sorry, let me turn there. Don't want to misquote it. I can't see the slides from way back here for some reason. All right, Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. Now, this was written hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. Right? So this isn't something that the apostles made up. This is a fulfillment of of prophecy. And see, when Jesus was born, right, the scribes understood that this passage spoke about the birth of Christ. Right? There's that story in the Gospel of Matthew where these wise men come and they come seeking Christ and they don't go 
uh, directly to Bethlehem, they go to King Herod, right? They go to Jerusalem and they go straight to the king. And they're like, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And Herod asked the scribes and the scholars and they like, uh, in Micah 5 2, you know, it's saying Bethlehem. They understood this. Now, this term Bethlehem, Ephrata, you know, Ephrath, Ephrath was the, the name of Bethlehem prior uh, to the, the um, Israelites conquering the land or what have you. But it's a term that means fruitful. And then the term Bethlehem means house of bread. So isn't it interesting that the bread of life came out of the fruit, fruitful house of bread. But then there's some interesting language in here because how can he be from everlasting? How can this one who is coming to be ruler be from everlasting? This is clearly a reference to the humanity and divinity of Christ. Right? The one to be ruler in Israel, we know there was a person that was to be from the line of David. We get that from uh, Samuel, uh, the, call it the Davidic covenant, where um, it was prophesied that the, the eternal king would be one from the line of David. So we know he's going to come through a human lineage, but then he's also from everlasting. A clear reference to the humanity and divinity of Christ. Jesus Himself calls himself the root and offspring of David in Revelation 22:16. How can he be the root of the tree and the fruit of the tree? I'll let you meditate on that one. How can Jesus be a hundred percent God and a hundred percent human? At the same time. Now if you want to dig a little deeper. I got, I got about a five hour teaching. We can go through on this. <laughs> but for the sake of uh, the Sunday morning. Sermon. <laughs> uh, I think this might be a blank. Let me see. Alright so how can Jesus be 100% God. And 100% human at the same time. One person. Two natures. Man, y'all good. <laughs> they call that the hypostatic union. <laughs> Divine nature and a human nature. Pastor Bill, that don't make no sense. What in the world is you talking about? Well, in his divinity, right, we know God is omnipresent. He's omniscient. Knows everything. He's omnipotent. He has all power. We call those the incommunicable attributes of God. Eternal. Infinite. Right? Those are attributes that only God has. But then when we think about Jesus, right? We're saying that he has a, a birth date. Right? <laughs> he, he had, he had a, a point in time where he took on humanity. We, we know that he could, he could only be one place at a time when he was in his human humanity. He was limited in space and time. He needed rest. He needed food. He mourned and cried. And he experienced death. Divine nature, human nature. In his divinity, he always existed. He acquired a human nature for our salvation. We're going to unpack it a little bit more. Next slide. John chapter 1. We're going to walk through a couple passages in John. John doesn't necessarily have a narrative account of the birth of Christ, but he does allude to it, if you will. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the word, the logos. In Hebrew, the debar. And the word was with God, and the word 
was God. He was in the beginning with God. So wait a minute. He was with God and he was God. Interesting. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. See, before the incarnation, right? The word incarnation means when Jesus took a human nature and entered into humanity as a baby, right? Christmas, right? Before that, Jesus exists as the word. He exists as God the Son, or as we would say, the second person of the Trinity. He is the pre-existent, eternal, uncreated creator. Had somebody ask me, where did God come from? He's uncreated. It's hard to wrap your mind around that because we all got a birth date. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe he was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Jesus is the true light. He's the source of life and the source of truth. Verse 10, he was in the world. You go move next slide. And the next slide. Okay. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is a reference to God entering into human history in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. He came unto his own. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Some people being affected by spiritual darkness could not recognize the creator and they rejected him. There were people who interacted with Jesus, who saw him do miracles, open blind eyes, raise up paralyzed people, people who were maimed. That means your arm or leg is cut off. He made them grow back. They saw these things and still rejected him because of spiritual darkness. Some people received him and became born again children of God. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And John the Baptist was deep. <laughs> and of his fullness we have all received in grace for grace for the law was given through Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ no one has seen God at any time that's talking about God and his unveiled glory said no man can see me and live People talking about, well, God appeared to me, I believe in him. God appeared to you, that's instant judgment. You die. <laughs> you wouldn't survive. 
No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, the only unique son. Some translations say the only begotten God. The only unique son who is in the bosom, who has that close, intimate relationship with the father. He has declared him. Jesus was born through the womb of a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can read that in Luke chapter 2. Mary said, how can I have a baby and I'm, I'm a virgin? I haven't known a man. He said, the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and overshadow you. Born through the womb of a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the way John describes that in verse 14 is he says, the word became flesh. It's a word that literally means he tabernacled among us. See, the Old Testament, we see a foreshadow of this in the literal tabernacle where the spirit of God or the glory of God would come down in a visible manifestation and fill the tabernacle with glory. And he's using this language to describe the incarnation. He came and tabernacled among us in a human body. The incarnation is the ultimate revelation of God to humanity. You want to know who God is, what God is like? Study Christ. Amen. Read the Gospels. He's the ultimate revelation of God. The Word become flesh. Next slide. Galatians chapter 4. I'm sorry, section 2. So why God taking on a human nature, the light of the world coming into the world, the creator coming into the world. Why was the light of the world hung on a tree? Why did that happen? Why was he rejected and killed? A shameful death, the death of a common criminal. That's how the Lord was treated. When he came. Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 through 5. Says but when the fullness of time had come. Right. There was a point in time where Christ took on a human nature. When the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son. Born of a woman. Born under the law. Why? To redeem those who were under the law. That we might receive the adoption as sons. The incarnation is part of God's plan for our salvation from sin. The incarnation is part of God's plan for our salvation from sin. Now I got to go to an Old Testament passage, Deuteronomy Chapter 21. It's an interesting passage. Why was the light of the world hung on a tree? Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22. says, If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is a curse of God. As wonderful as the Christmas season is, the birth of the God man was necessary because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody. All humanity has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve the condemnation of death for our sin. Doesn't matter the amount of sins you committed. You might, oh, I'm not as bad as this person, this and that. God is holy. His standard is absolute perfection. And if you believe you've met that standard, then 
You just sin because you just lied to yourself. You sin in thought, word, or deed. <laughs> We all deserve condemnation for our sin. And see, when it says he who is hanged on a tree is accursed of God, see, the curse comes from breaking God's commandment. See, the reason that the person was put to death in the first place and hung on a tree was because they had committed a sin worthy of death, right? There was death penalties attached to stuff. And so, don't get caught up in people trying to keep the law like they're being more holy and more righteous than other people because you break God's law one time, you break God's commandment one time, you're under the curse. Period. You can't work your way out of the curse. Jesus voluntarily experienced death on a cross, right? Two words uh, used for the cross and, and the, mo the word that's used the most um, is translated cross, but then five times in the New Testament it's described as a tree. It's referring to that it was wood, right? It was wood. But there's a reason why they say he was hung on a tree because of this verse right here. He voluntary, voluntarily experienced death on a cross or a tree as an innocent person. He was innocent. He was the only innocent one who did not deserve to die. And he voluntarily died the death that we deserved for us. Galatians, still in Galatians, going back to chapter 3, Paul admonishing people who want to try to live under the law who want to try to earn their salvation by living under the law. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. All of humanity is affected by the generational curse of an inherited sin nature. This is something else why people reject Christ. They think they don't need him. They think they're good. They think that my good will outweigh my bad. That's not what the Bible teaches. I don't know, you know, some other people might teach that. That's not what the Bible teaches. All of humanity is affected by the generational curse of an inherited. People talk about well, these generational curses in my family. The generational curse is sin. And we got that from Adam. And the way to break that is through Christ. Amen. Christ hung on the tree for our redemption. He served as our substitute. Those who place their faith in Christ are free from the curse that comes from breaking God's law. If you are living in sin, you are under the curse of the law. And the only way to break that is through Christ. Unless you want to keep living under a curse. I don't. So I got saved. Praise God. <laughs> Root working and sage, burning sage and all that stuff. You need the blood of Jesus. Walking under the power of the spirit of God. That's how you keep the devils out your life. Burning sage and chanting. Then going to get another demonized person who more demonized than you are to try to fight them off for you. Those who place faith in Christ are free from the curse that comes from breaking God's law. No amount of good works will break the curse. Only the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. If you trust in Jesus, the Spirit of God is going to come and live in you, and you can resist the devil Amen. through the authority of Christ and the blood of Jesus that's covering your life. Amen. 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 All right, I'm almost done. I know y'all getting tired of me. First Peter chapter 2. 
verse 21 through 22. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Now, this concept, right? People say, well, why does God allow this? Why does God allow that? Why would God enter into the suffering? He entered into the suffering. He suffered for us. Meditate on that. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Now, this is uh, the context is he's encouraging believers who are experiencing serious persecution for their faith. And it's not just people talking about them or, you know, things like that. This is like people being beat, killed, uh, losing their property. Uh, because they profess faith in Christ. So he's encouraging them. And he's reminding them that Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body, that's why he needed a human body, so he could bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The incarnation was necessary for Christ. To provide the perfect example of humanity. How to endure suffering and persecution. He lived as a man and never sinned. All right, so in Hebrews says he was tempted in all points that we are yet without sin. He succeeded where Adam failed. Right? Bible teaches that God created Adam and Eve. The first man, first woman. And they failed. They failed to Passed the test of temptation. Where Adam failed, Christ succeeded. He did not retaliate when he was persecuted. He did not retaliate when he was wronged. He submitted to the Father's timetable for executing judgment against the wicked. That's what it means when it says that he committed himself to him who judges righteously, right? Like we know that when a word is in, in italics, it wasn't in the original, he committed to him who judges righteously. Meaning that those who don't get saved, they're going to be dealt with. They're going to have their day in court. But it's actually going to be a sentencing. It's not going to be a trial because you're already condemned. It's just, it's going to be a sentencing hearing. But he needed a physical body to carry our sins on the tree. Now we can live for righteousness with a restored relationship with God. All right. Last passage. I know I'm in overtime or close to it, but please. Last section. All right. Does scripture forbid the use of Christmas trees? Short answer, no. But you have some people that will come knock on your door that don't believe in the divinity of Christ that will try to use a Jeremiah passage try to tell you that you can't use a Christmas tree. Well, let's just destroy that right now. So, <laughs> let's demolish that, that foolishness right now. All right, Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Yeah. Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the Gentiles are dismayed at them. For the custom of the peoples are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They are upright like a palm tree and they cannot speak. They must be carried, but they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. Okay? 
this passage in context is warning Israel to avoid worshiping idols, right? Commandment number two, do not make any idols, right? He's, it's describing the process that pagans use to create an idol from gathering raw materials, wood, they carve it up into an image, they overlay it with gold and silver, the idol was most likely carved into an image, the sin is worshiping an idol, Okay, if you're bowing down before your Christmas tree prostrate and worshiping it, that's idolatry. And you need to repent. Amen. Verse 6. Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your rightful due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. But they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Silver is beaten into plates and it is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. The work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the metalsmith. Blue and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skillful men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. God will eliminate all false gods from the universe. He's going to get rid of all of them. The creator will judge those who make idols and worship created things, right? We see idolatry is a problem even into the New Testament where they were coming against the spreading of the gospel because they were making their money off of making these little statues that people was worshiping. Amen? Verse 11 through 16. Thus you shall say to them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. He's going to get rid of them. He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom. and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. And he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Everyone is dull-hearted without knowledge. Every metalsmith is put to shame by an image, for his molded image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are futile, a work of errors. In the time of their punishment, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the maker of all things, the creator. Don't worship created things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance, the Lord of hosts, is his name. It is foolish to worship a lifeless statue instead of the living God. He says idolatry is a worthless doctrine. In the New Testament it's called a doctrine of demons. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 he says with the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice unto devils and not to God. People who worship idols are worshiping demons. God is going to take care of them. Last passage of scripture. Jeremiah chapter 7. 16 through 19. This is, this is a scary passage. God talking to Jeremiah. He said, therefore do not pray for this people. That's scary. Therefore do not pray for this people. Nor lift up, lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? Listen to verse 18. Listen to this. The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven and they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? 
Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? Next slide. <laughs> See, entire families participated in idolatry. The children were involved. The fathers were involved. The mothers were involved. Bread and drink offerings were offered to idols. This angered God to the point where he forbid Jeremiah for interceding for them. Sin causes you to lose face or bring dishonor upon yourself. There was an honor-shame culture. They were dishonoring themselves. That's what sin does. What does that have to do with, with us? Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is from a... Um, from an article uh, on that slide, that's an article from, I think, the New York Times or some news website. I got it up there. Millions of families leave out milk. Sounds like a drink offering. And cookies. <laughs> Sounds like a bread offering. I don't know. I might be a little slow, but... Millions of families leave out milk and cookies for Santa on Christmas Eve. False God worship. Next slide. Santa Claus is described with supernatural abilities. Knows when you sleep and knows when you wake, knows if you've been bad or good. Sounds supernatural to me. Knows the behavior of all children, right? Omniscience. Right. He can enter billions of homes in one night. He can provide presents to billions of people in one night. Mm. Omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. Oh. Sounds like on something only God can do to me. <laughs> then we got children writing letters to Santa. Tell Santa what you want for Christmas. What did you to ask Santa for for Christmas? It don't that sound like a supplication? Right? We make supplications to God when we ask him for stuff. Why are we teaching children to ask a false God for something? Hey, look, I, I've been in youth ministry for 20 years. The parents get mad at me when I talk about Christmas. <laughs> How many parents teach their children to ask Santa for gifts but never teach them to ask God for anything? Next slide. In my closing. <laughs> First John 5, 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Going and sitting on Santa lap telling them what you want. Idolatry. We can sit down and have a conversation about it, but we need to stop doing that. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. First John 5 21. Do you believe, next slide, do you believe that Jesus of Nazareth is a sinless, is the sinless Son of God, born of a virgin, a hundred percent God, and a hundred percent man? who hung on the tree for the sin of the world. Do you believe that? Yes. 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 And see, when we, in, we can't indoctrinate children with idolatry and the gospel and then wonder why they struggle when they get older and they're struggling to believe. <laughs> Do you believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the sinless son of God born of a virgin, 100% God, and 100% man who hung on the tree for the sins of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Amen. That's the best gift anybody can receive yes, sir. is the gift of eternal life yes, sir. from the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Amen. Yes, <laughs>